Hey, it's NPR's Book of the Day. I'm Andrew Limbaugh. I'm not sure what it says about us, but my wife and I love stories about marriages falling apart. You know, bonus points if it's about the couple getting kind of jaded and disillusioned as they have kids and move into the burbs and all that. Like a couple of years into our relationship, we read uh, Revolutionary Road by Richard Yates together. And it was great. I I I think we still have uh, multiple copies floating around the house somewhere. Anyway, today's book is similarly up that alley. It's by Nathan Hill, and it's called Wellness. It's getting lots of buzz and great reviews and all that. It's about a marriage that's changing, sure. But it's also about a lot of other things that speak to our current malaise. And in this interview with Here and Now's Robin Young, right after the book got some major props from Oprah, there's an interesting moment where he calls the marriage story a container that can help address all these other things going on in the world. This message comes from NPR sponsor Betterment. The drama of having an enemy turned lover is never chill, but your investing portfolio should be. Betterment is the investing app that lets you be totally chill about your finances. Their automated tech makes it easy to get in the market and stay in the market. Save the drama for that moment when you realize your mortal enemy is actually your soulmate. Betterment. Be invested. And totally chill. Learn more at Betterment.com. Investing involves risk. Performance is not guaranteed. This message comes from NPR sponsor, Robinsberger. Make time for fun and play with Robinsberger. Level up your next game night or relax with family and friends over the perfect puzzle or immersive board game. Up for a challenge? Test your wits with Logic Games from their Think Fun brand. A family company since 1883, Robinsberger puzzles and games spark creativity and ignite curiosity. Find family-friendly fun for all ages at Amazon.com. Today, big moment, Oprah Winfrey unveiled her latest book club pick. It is Nathan Hill's new novel, Wellness. We concur. In fact, we just spoke with him before the announcement. His 2016 novel, The Knicks, drew comparisons to authors of massive works like David Foster Wallace and Dickens. In The Knicks, he covers online gaming, Norwegian mythology, the Occupy Wall Street protests. His new, equally sprawling novel, Wellness, covers Kansas Prairie Fires, the Chicago art scene, and as I said in our introduction, partner swapping. Partner swapping, really? Do people really do that? And the failure <laughs> <laughs> and the failures of today's young people transitioning into adults, and also the invisible strings that attach us all to our parents and our past and make us dance like marionettes. The book is titled Wellness after a fictional research company which was founded to debunk claims made by over-the-counter drugs, but which eventually decides, hey, if placebos work, let's sell placebos. Nathan Hill, now we know what you've been doing for seven years. Welcome back. Thank you so much. It's nice to be back. Our two protagonists, Jack and Elizabeth, he's 20-something, skinny, hip, he hopes, photographer from Kansas. She's an intellectual from an exuberantly wealthy family in Connecticut. When we first meet them, they're in their 20s. We watch as they watch and fall in love with each other through their apartment windows in Chicago. This is the nod to Hitchcock's rear window. Where did you get this beginning thread for this? Believe it or not, the first scene of the book was written about 20 years ago. I had just moved to New York City at the time. I was in my uh, mid-20s, and I had this tiny little studio apartment in Queens, and uh, its lone window looked out into like this brick wall of other people's apartments, and it inspired this short story about two people who are glimpsing each other and very slowly falling in love. I thought it was fabulously romantic at the time, and then I kind of forgot about it. Fast forward, I'm, I'm in my mid-40s. I've been happily married for many years, and I sort of remembered that short story, and like my opinion about it had changed. Oh. Like What I thought was fabulously romantic in my 20s and my 40s struck me suddenly as kind of naive. These two people were projecting all these fantasies onto the other, and I now understood how little that had to do with building a real relationship. So it, it made me really wonder what would have become of them. And we get a glimpse of how it's going to go because there's a wonderful... A section where they're lying again in this, you know, they have no money, they don't care, they're in this great hip artist scene in Chicago talking about the things they love. She says, lobster rolls warm with melted butter. He says, 
cheese ravioli out of a can. He's Rage Against the Machine. She's the violin solo from Scheherazade. (laughs) Watching a Polaroid develop, he says, autumn leaf peeping in the White Mountains. And what he doesn't tell her then is that he has no idea what she's talking about. You know, he's this son of the Midwest. You were born in Cedar Rapids, Iowa. Your grandparents were farmers. Your family moved constantly through the Midwest, Illinois, Oklahoma, Kansas, because your father was working his way up at Kmart. Now, I see a little of Jack there from the prairie, but you also, you know, moved around a lot like Elizabeth. Her father is a abusive corporate raider, you know, different there. Yeah. But I'm wondering if that's where you pulled some of this from. Wow, that's all accurate and uh, and a great reading. <sighs> um, Jack it has a lot of me in him. I mean, he's come to the big city in the same way that I want to do. I always sort of long to go to the city and get into you know literature, get into art, and kind of join that crowd. So that part of me is really alive in Jack. And I think Elizabeth represents maybe the person I thought I wanted to be. Like, I wanted to have her sophistication. I wanted to have her intellectual background. But you can't have a real character who's just an invention of your fantasy. She's got to have a real life, too. And so, yeah, I gave her my own experience of moving from town to town to town. I didn't have friends that would last longer than 18 to 24 months. So they each have a piece of me. And then in their relationship, I feel like Jack is me when I'm feeling a little insecure and maybe I get a little needy or a little clingy. And Elizabeth is me when I'm feeling a little overwhelmed and and I just need some alone time for a while. And so they, they, I kind of split myself off and kind of gave pieces to each of my two main characters. Well, you know, Jack breaks my heart at times because he finally makes his way to school. He wants to study art and photography, and he doesn't know the words they're using. And it, look, we have a divide. We have a class divide, a cultural divide, geographic divide in this country. And my heart aches a little bit for him. And by the way, he then goes on to accidentally, (laughs) let's just say in a private act on his computer, an act that should have been really embarrassing, but he turned it around, he flipped it around and called it art. And the professors fell for it. You're also deflating a lot of egos in that academic area. Well, yeah, I mean, I remember the first time I went to a college art history class and I did not grow up going to museums. So when I got to my first art history class, I remember being blown away by art I was seeing for the first time and how everybody else was already bored with it by now. (laughs) You know, it was like, I felt like I had to keep my mouth shut for like 10 years until I caught up with everybody. Well, but you get across, I think, some important feelings from people in the middle of the country. You know, something about Boston or New England painters trying to depict the Midwest or the Kansas Prairie. They can't. I mean, you really do fling a lot of that throughout the book of... Uh, I, I do, yeah. It's, it's possible I have a little chip on my shoulder about being <laughs> from the Midwest. And I and I do really love that landscape. I write about the Flint Hills of Kansas, and I find that landscape yeah. just so beautiful and so peaceful. And it's true that landscape painters in the Hudson River School like came to the prairie and did not know how to paint it. But then there's so much more. Suddenly we're in a kind of a high-tech research company, this wellness company that's testing, as we said, these products and then ending up selling placebos. We're spending pages on the algorithm that Facebook uses to engage users more and more, shovel mis- and disinformation at them. There's this constant flip-flop between the almost noir of the early meeting of the two and the prairie in Kansas, and then this modern-day life that's just hammering this couple. They have a child. Suddenly, all thoughts of being an artist and, you know, living that bohemian life are out the window. They're trying to buy a condo. She is exhausted, believing that she has to do everything the way the latest article is telling her to do with her child. And it feels to me like both of them are not facing something from their families that becomes a a, a new character in the book, this history. This is what brought me back to writing about these two characters. Why I wanted to write about a marriage is that the marriage story seemed like a nice container for a lot of the things that I've been really concerned with lately. It's not a big secret that over the last several years, it's been a challenge just getting everyone to agree on what reality is, Mm -hmm. just basic facts. A lot of people in my own life that I thought I knew pretty well suddenly seemed like they were living in just radically different fact universes from me. And so I was really interested in exploring the stories we believe in about the world and the delusions and fantasies that can sometimes substitute for reality. 
And the love story is full of fantasy. So I decided to write this love story that would be a kind of Trojan horse for all of these other concerns that I had about how our worlds are shaped by the stories we believe in. So placebo became part of that. The algorithm became part of that. The art became part of that. So I I like doing this. I like taking a central theme and fragmenting it and looking at it through a variety of lenses. Did you actually go to a suburban club for couple swapping? (laughs) (laughs) I was wondering if anybody was going to ask me that. (laughs) And? The thing I really appreciate, so I have friends who are, you know, in the lifestyle or polyamorous or... Really? Oh. Yeah. And and like the thing that I really appreciate about what they do is that I think a lot of people who are cis, hetero, like myself, we have a sort of default story about what marriage is supposed to be. It's the kind of high romance, you know, one person for life kind of story. And of course that works for a lot of people. But what I really appreciate is that There are people out there, there are whole communities who are telling different stories. And of course, this is a book about the stories that we believe in. And one of those stories is about what marriage is itself. And so it seemed appropriate to bring that element in there in a marriage story. Mm. Okay. Well, Nathan Hill, we should say there's terrible sadness, but there's also sort of a rebirth. I'm wondering if is that that sadness something you've known? You know, it's terrible. Yeah, well, I mean, I think like a lot of people, the pandemic was was a really sad time. I lost people. My wife is a classical musician who was not performing anymore, and she was wondering if she would ever play her instrument ever again in front of people. And then when we most needed people was the time that we had to be farthest apart from them. So that sadness, I had to put it somewhere, and those scenes, that's where I put it, almost to process it for myself. Oh, boy. Nathan Hill, his new novel, wellness. Thank you so much and best of luck with it. It's uh, just terrific. Thank you. Uh, Thank you so much. I appreciate it. And again, Nathan's new novel, Wellness, just named Oprah's Book Club pick. It's fall, so maybe you're figuring out your Halloween costume or where to order a pumpkin spice latte. And if you're figuring out what buzzy movies, TV shows, and music you should check out this fall, we've got you covered. Listen to the Pop Culture Happy Hour podcast from NPR. This message comes from NPR sponsor, City. They're not an airline, but their network connects global businesses in nearly 160 local markets. With over two centuries of experience, they're not just any bank. They are City. More at city.com slash wearecity.